Let me, you, let me let me change the question. Who's more influential? Who's more influential, hmm. the barber or the yeah, doctor? Yeah, yeah, okay. When well, you put it like that, uh, it's definitely the barber. Hey guys, real quick, Dr. Dale here. All right, so I want you guys to do me a favor. Before you start this episode, please hit that pause button and click subscribe or click follow or click like, whatever it is. We work really hard to bring you guys this good information to uplift the entire community, and we really appreciate you guys supporting our efforts and our work. Love you guys. Enjoy the episode. What is up, family? I'm Dr. Dale, the author of How to Raise a Doctor, the author of Pre-Med Mondays, Black Men and White Coats, and the Dr. Doc Children series. And of course, you listen to the Black Men and White Coats podcast, a place where Black clinicians have the platform to share their stories with listeners like you. Man, I am super excited about today's episode. It's something completely different, completely new. We've never done anything like this on Black Men and White Coats in the past. So today's going to be the very first ever episode of Black Men and White Coast that we're actually doing a dialogue instead of a monologue. So usually you guys know the whole purpose of the platform is to let other docs tell their docs, not just doctors, actually nurse practitioners, PAs, anybody in healthcare, we let them tell their own stories, right? So I just normally just be quiet. I don't say anything. I just let them spill out the beans and say their entire story. But today we're going to do something a little bit different, right? We're going to do something a little bit different. And before I introduce you to my guy who's here on the show with me today, let me remind you guys, everybody who's a pre-medical student, make sure you check out premedmondays.com, premedmondays.com. What we do on Pre-Med Mondays is we offer you guys coaching services. So we make sure that every pre-medical student has the opportunity to get the best guidance that we can possibly give you guys and help you along your journey to medical school. And we do that for a crazy, crazy, crazy affordable price. So nobody can say that money is a limitation for them whatsoever. Every Monday night, you're on a video call with me, with Dr. Daniel, or with a medical student coach, one of us coaches, and our job is to help you be successful. And also, if you're in the field of healthcare, if you're a doctor or a nurse, anybody in the field of healthcare, or if you're in the pre-health journey, make sure you join diversemedicine.com www.diversemedicine.com. And there you got a whole community of people who are just like us, who are doing our best to help you guys be successful and make it into this field of medicine, right? PremedMondays.com, DiverseMedicine.com. Excited to connect with you guys on that. All right. Now, let me introduce you to my man, my guy, my homie, Dr. Stephen Noble. Now, um, you guys probably already know Dr. Noble. At least I hope you do. If you do, then that will tell me that you're a listener of uh, this podcast because he did one of our earlier podcasts. Um, goodness, I don't remember how long ago that was, but he had a great, wow. great, great episode. So he, he's actually on. You remember how long ago that was? Uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Dale. Good to be here. It's probably, it's probably been, man, uh, almost a year now. So Goodness it's gracious. Been, yeah. And yeah, actually, you guys while. can't. So, and also, this is probably the first episode that we're actually video recording and audio recording. Those of you guys who are watching the video, you can see the book right here in the background. He's one of those faces on the book. So <laughs> not just was he on the podcast, he's actually... Um, actually in the book as well. So you can check out more of his story in the Black Men and White Coats book. And he's one of our biggest supporters for our documentary that we're making, right? So he's an associate producer, um, supporter in our Black Men and White Coats documentary. We had a great time. He flew out to Chicago with us when we did a lot of filming of some, some, you know, some pretty key people. We were out there together filming in Chicago. Oh, yeah. And, um, yeah, it was nice. Yeah, we had a great time, man. You know, Dr. Noble and I were just kicking it and chatting all day long, filming, and, and then he joined us with the the summit on uh, the following day the Chicago Black Men and White Coat Summit. All right, so I'm super geeked. So what we're going to talk about today is the black barbershop and healthcare. So we're talking about black health and the black barbershop. And you know, I'm, I'm, real briefly, I'll tell you guys how this episode kind of came about, and then I'm going to hop in and, and I'm going to go at it with Dr. Noble here. We're going to have some fun, okay? So, man, I remember when it was, but one day, you know, Dr. Noble had told me about this this thing that he's a part of. Am I okay to say the name of name of it or no? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Life chair. Yeah. Life chair, life chair, right? So um, he's part of, and I'll let him talk more about that later on, but he's part of, um, 
um, I guess I'll call it a group. I don't want to call it a company, organization, whatever we want to call it. It's called Life Chair. And he was telling me about it. I was like, man, yo, that is such a cool idea. And, you know, we need that in the community and such. So we talked about it and I started learning a little bit more about this idea and the, you know, general concept being how the barbershops can help the healthcare and the black community, right? And then one day we're chatting, and keep in mind, we're in COVID season, right? So it's COVID-19, everything's on lockdown, nobody's going out. I'm a pulmonary critical care doctor, so I deal with lungs. He's a cardiothoracic surgeon, so he deals with lungs, right? So we're both like heavy in this COVID understanding. And he says like, yeah, Dale, you know, we need to go ahead and open up the barbershops. And I said, what? Open up the barbershops? And, you know, my thought was just, hey, let's just shut down everything, shut it all down. Um, but, but, you know, he, he was, he was pushing, he was persistent. He said, he said, Dale, let me come on the show. Let's come on the podcast. And let's, let, let's talk about this barbershop deal. Right. Um, and the thing that really got me to, at first, I was kind of like, I don't know if I want him to come on the show. Cause he might start trying to get people to go out and get their hair cut in the middle of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. But the thing that got me is, um, he convinced my brother, Dr. Daniel, right. So, um, Dr. Daniel has been, has, has been doing some stuff with them now and connecting with them and, and, um, you know, of course, I was, I wanted to have him on the show anyways, but then Dr. Daniel sent me a message one day, like, hey, you need to hear what Steven's got to say about, about this barbershops and black communities, even in the setting of COVID. So that's why we're here today. That's why we're here today, right? So real quick, I'm going to let you introduce yourself again, kind of, and I'll start picking your brain and all that. And before I do that, I'm going to say, um, you know, thank you and salute, because I do want to always remember that um, Navy, he served the country in the Navy. So definitely want to, you know, hats off. I'm wearing my hat right now, but I would take it off if I had a haircut, you know. <laughs> but um, thank you, salute. And I appreciate your your service to the country. Tell them a little bit about yourself and then we'll hop in here and talk about some, some barbershopping and black health. Definitely. Uh, well, appreciate it, Dr. Dale. And, you know, thank you and salute to you for this, uh, for this platform. Uh, you know, I think that uh, the whole movement of Black Men and White Codes, uh, the Rise Up documentary, uh, it's just really a testament to, uh, you know, the need for um, uh, seeing a problem out there in society and then addressing it. Seeing the problem that there's not enough black males going into medicine and then addressing that issue is a testament to everybody as far as um, both entrepreneurship and just how do you, you know, fix society and, and, and fix life. And, and one of that is just identifying that there's a problem and going out to fix it. And that kind of led me into into medicine from the standpoint of, you know, one of the things that I love to do was just to, you know, learn about the human body. And so, you know, given the, uh, the support of my family and my grandparents, you know, they always kind of pushed me to study that. And then, you know, that led me to go into, you know, the med school. Uh, uh, I loved, I fell in love with surgery. Uh, so I decided to do general surgery, fell in love with cardiothoracic surgery, uh, specialized treatment of heart and lung, lung cancer. And so that really just kind of propelled me into, um, into what I do today and what I love to do. Uh, and so during that whole journey of, you know, medicine, surgery, residency, fellowship, things of that nature. Um, you know, I met my wife, who's a hairstylist. Um, uh, yeah, see, I, didn't, I didn't know that part of the story. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 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 you know, in, in, uh, I knew her in college and then uh, we uh, got together in med school and then we got married when I was uh, in residency in Portland, Oregon. So, uh, you know, during this time, you know, she's a hairstylist uh, for over 20 years on the medicine. And I would go to her shop and in her shop, uh, she would have clients come in and she's, you know, they're, you know, seeing each other every two weeks, every four weeks or something like that. And they're receiving advice. And it's, you know, my wife is sitting up here giving advice from, you know, love, marriage, um, relationships, um, you know, and health. And so it was really seeing that relationship between my wife and her clients that made me think, you know, there's something to here. Plus, you know, they were coming to see her more often than, you know, they may have been seeing their physician. Plus, my wife always talked about, you know, the business of hair has always been consistent, that even in downtime, you know, people find a way to get their, you know, their hair done. So I was like, you know, there's, there's something to that. Uh, and so then it just kind of led me to, you know, sort of the natural association uh, with the barbershop and then, you know, thinking about, you know, could healthcare be delivered, in, in, you know, in the barbershop? And lo and behold, as, you know, I delved into it, I saw that, you know, I was thinking this was a novel idea, but, you know, the research had already been done. You know, first and foremost, the, the, the barbershops kind of came out of, you know, or healthcare kind of came out of barbershops as far as, um, you know, the first, you know, barbers were called barber surgeons because they were very good with the use of the razor. So uh, people would go to the barbershop, they'd get a haircut, but they'd also do some kind of basic, you know, surgical uh, techniques on people. And so that kind of represented hold on, why hold the barber. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> we'll call y'all on that one. Tell me, tell me more about that one. Tell me more about that. About the basic. So, 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 so back in the day, you know, 
leaching was considered to be the treatment and the cure. And so leaching is just basically like bleeding people out and letting the, you know, letting the blood just go. So, so the barbers happened, were leeching people? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Wow. And so not necessarily, and, and again, you know, you didn't really see so much of the barber surgeons in, um, you know, what we would think of present day America. So in the 1800s, and you, you really didn't see a lot of that. A lot of this was, you know, some of the uh, prehistoric or not prehistoric, but some of the more uh, ancient sort of times of the barbers, you know, in Egypt and things like that. So we're talking about in the B.C. sort of era and then in London uh, in, where you had the, the, the marriage between the barber surgeons and the physicians uh, more so in the 1600s and so. But as yeah, far as I ours, hope, I hope nobody was leeching people in the 1900s. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. You, you really didn't see too much of that. But uh, so, so yeah, that kind of represented why the barber pole was the color that it was: red for the arterial blood, blue for the venous, and then white for the staff. And people were grabbing off the stick to get each. It's funny, um, man, because I, I was I was looking at that picture just today, and I was gonna I was wondering about that. You know, the little the little barber pole you see. So that's what yep. that's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, if you imagine this being the barber pole, they you know they would just grab on to you know while they're you know creating the you know the cuts in the skin, and so that's. And so the white was a bandage that would eventually get put on the wound uh, after the leaching and whatnot. Uh-huh. So this whole notion of healthcare in the barbershop, you know, is, you know, isn't necessarily new. It's really a matter of how do we kind of expound upon it. And so then what you had in the 80s were some physicians, uh, some black physicians that really kind of took a look at, um, you know, delivering healthcare, if you will, or just monitoring blood pressure, especially blood pressure in black men. They saw that if you associated that monitoring of, of blood pressure, you know, like me. But, but before you delve into that, um, yeah. tell me a little bit more about why is the barbershop so special for the black community? So why, you know, because obviously you come into this from a perspective of we can address some health disparities in the, in the um, not just unrepresented minority, but, you know, specifically we're, we have an emphasis on black um, discussion right now. So what, what makes that different from the white community? Yeah, so... Um, one of the first things is that the barbershop represents that entry into entrepreneurship. So after uh, slavery, you know, the barbershop really represents that opportunity for blacks to kind of establish, you know, business. Mm-hmm. And so you see it as one of the two common meeting grounds in which we as a people kind of had control over the environment. The other major institution is the church. So you really didn't see too many outside influences affecting how we kind of do things inside of the four walls of the barbershop per se or the church. Now, right after slavery, there was, you know, um, history shows us that there were some uh, what we call color line barbers, whereas initially barbers were just cutting the hairs of white men. And so what you saw between the, the North and the South was that there was a division between black barbers cutting black people's hair versus black barbers cutting white people's hair. But by and large, the barbershop was that first entry into entrepreneurship and thus independency or some form of financial independency. With that being said, when we start to control our own environment, it started to be that place of refuge, that place in which people will come, you know, kind of hang out, you know, people, you know, where we could come and just kind of relax, you know, and every pun intended as far as letting our hair down and just, and just being ourselves. And it was really that time in which we didn't have to worry about, you know, what was going on in the world. We walked into the barbershop, you know, kind of the, you know, troubles of the rest of the world kind of went away, you know, during that time where we convened. And what really for all intents and purposes is a neutral ground. I mean, yes, there's conversations of politics and race and, you know, sports and, and heated debates. But by and large, I mean, it's a fairly neutral ground. It's like, you know, Sweden, you know, from the standpoint of in the community, like you can come to the barbershop and, you know, let bygones be bygones. I like that. I like that. I like that. And there, it sounds like along with that, there's come a certain level of trust. Yeah, and I, I mean, you know, everyone, I mean, you don't even have to, you know, folks that have their barber know that there is that level of trust between, you know, hey, that's, you know, that's my barber. You know, I don't deviate from my barber. I'm not switching up going to this barber, you know, within a shop. You know, I'm not going from this barber to this barber to this barber. And so with that, you develop that trust because you're seeing this person, you know, depending upon how often you get your haircut, you know, once every two weeks, you know, once a month. And so you start to develop hey, that. But if, you, but, if you, but if you fresh to death, it's once every week. <laughs> right, right. You try to keep it fresh it's once every week. Keep that and line so, right. And ex- right. And especially man, down south, you know, when they're getting that razor line out, you're mm-hmm. like, you know, there is that level of trust of like, man, don't cut me. You know, don't push my line back. Mm-hmm. Don't push my wig back. None of that stuff. So there is that sense of trust. And I think at the end of it, one of the best parts of the barbershop was that okay, whole. So, sorry, sorry. That, that don't cut me just made me think about um 
the Malcolm X movie when they're, you know, when he's getting the cut <laughs> with the razor. <laughs> yeah. All right, my bad, my bad. My, I'm all over the place. That's all good. It's just one of those things that at the end of it, what they what they give you that Mary and you see yourself is, you know, I had one barber say, you know, that always used to say, Welcome back. Like, you know, mm-hmm. this is the guy that I remember, you know, when you're all nice and cut and, you know, fresh and stuff like that. So it's a, it's just a great place. I mean, I think that, you know, most black men and just people in general, you know, when they think about the barbershop, it's, you know, there's pleasant memories more so than negative. I mean, like, like you said, man, you got people who like, you got people, you know, I'm going bald now. So you got people like me who just go sit in the barbershop just to hang out. I don't, I don't do that anymore. But, you know, you have some people who just go there just to hang out. They knew they weren't getting a haircut. Just go just to hang out, just to be in the community and, and have that conversation. Let me, let me ask you this. Um, who's more trusted, the barber or the doctor? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, I think it depends on who you ask. I mean, I would, you know, I like to say that the doctor, you know, is trusted more than the barber. Um, but I think that, that, you know, I'm biased. I'm a, you know, I'm a physician. Um, and it really comes down to, oh, let me change, let me, cha- let me, let me change the question. Who's more influential? Who's more influential, mm-hmm. the barber or the yeah, doctor? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, you put it like that. Uh, it's definitely the barber. You know, you know, the barber has that opportunity to change, you know, change people's lives, you know, uh, not that, uh, you know, not that we don't ask physicians, but I think because of the constant contact that a barber has. And that's one of the things that I think that because a, a barber in hairstyles can be more influential because of that consistent contact, that consistency is important to be influential. And we see it with ads all the time. You you know, Coca-Cola is going to hit you with several ads, you know, in, in a minute. And so it's really that ad after ad after ad after ad after ad, mm-hmm. you know, in which you get cut, kind of told the same thing over and over again. So if you see that that consistent, in, you know, person, that consistency becomes influential. If you just see your physician once a year, if that, that one word, that one time that you see that person in that visit, maybe 15 minutes, you know, then and gone, um, you're not going to have that opportunity to be influential. And as much as we as physicians like to think, you know, all the, you know, all my plaques on the wall and all my, you know, degrees may present me as influential. I don't have that constant contact, whereas that barber does. And so they're planting little seeds each and every time. And if, and so if we as physicians have the opportunity to plant those little seeds every two weeks, every four weeks on a consistent basis, I, you know, I would say that we could be as influential in a positive way. Um, more so than, than the barber, because there's a lot of things that, you know, barbers can be influential, uh, uh, globally, um, that we as physicians just don't have the opportunity, uh, to be. And so I think that it really comes down to the constant, uh, contact that individuals have. And that just goes for any, you know, just life in general, mentorship, parenting, just that constant contact. All right. So then, okay. So let, let's hop into this year. So healthcare disparities, of course, there are a lot of things that impact the, the black community at, um, you know, higher, higher degrees than other communities. How is the barbershop going to help address those specific things? Right. So we're talking about, you know, diabetes, coronary artery disease, all, all these random, you know, conditions, chronic medical conditions. How's the barbershop going to attack those things? How do we, how do we do this? So I think, it, you know, we got to leverage um, the things that we know about the barbershop and, and people in general and just, you know, and kind of meet people where they're at. I think uh, one of the first ways that the barbershop is able to tackle it is understanding that this is a, you know, understanding the environment. And, and first and foremost, the environment is an environment in which people feel comfortable. I think that when true health care is best, when both parties, the patient, the the provider the provider system are both in places in which you feel comfortable all too often we meet patients when they're at least comfortable mm-hmm. i know you as well as myself you know a lot of times you know i tell people when you know when they see me in clinic you know they, they say i never want to see you again and I, and I tell them i totally understand because when i meet people mm-hmm. they're truly the most uncomfortable the worst pain in their life the worst chest pain in their life you know, I, they have lung cancer, you know, they're uncomfortable. But at the barbershop, people are comfortable. And when people are comfortable, they are vulnerable to either A, tell you things about themselves that they may not tell other people. Mm-hmm. That gives us a way to go in, to get into mental health. As well as when they're, you know, when you test someone or, or, or get someone's vital signs when they're in a comfortable state, you can kind of get a true sense of what their blood pressure is. For example, we all know sort of the white coat phenomenon in which, you know, you get your blood pressure taken, you know, maybe in the, in the doctor's office and it may be 15 to 20 points higher simply because of the stress that is associated with, you know, the white coat. 
you know, having to get to a doctor's appointment, having to get through traffic, having to get there on time, sitting there, you're being rushed, you don't want to be late. You, ne- you don't necessarily know what you're going to be told by the physician. And so your blood pressure may be several points higher than what it actually is. However, you may get treated for that elevated blood pressure. You may get put on medications that you may not necessarily need to be on. And that's just a snapshot in time. That's one vital sign, that one blood pressure at one time. Whereas if you take your blood pressure at the barbershop, a place that's comfortable, a place that's consistent, and you're relaxed, you may find that first the blood pressure may be lower than what it initially was. And then the other thing is that as you check it over time, it may not have been truly as high as it really was. So in this um so in this situation that you're describing right now, you per se wouldn't wouldn't um improve the treatment of a medical condition. What you might do is you might decrease the need of excess expenditure. So you know, you might prevent people from having to, having to spend money on meds they don't need. You might prevent these adverse drug reactions, things of that sort. Correct. Yeah. So, so that's one, you know, sort, sort of immediate, you know, sort of, sort of result. The, the second thing is, um, you know, being able to connect that individual uh, with the appropriate healthcare provider. So let's say, you know, the blood pressure truly is high. So then how do you take that information and then filter it back to the healthcare system is one avenue in which, you know, a lot of these uh, studies that looked at the relationship between barbershops and healthcare really worked out was that there was a relationship between the barbershop, the barbershop kind of served as that healthcare liaison, kind of connecting the, the patron or the patient to the healthcare system. And so... Um, the uh, then the third thing is just really the support that a barber let me, can so, give. So, so let me go back to that second thing. So how 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 do you do that? Because you know, like like you said, the idea is not novel, right? And thinking back to when I was in med school, you know, we go to the barber shop and we try to do blood pressures and all this jazz. And actually, I remember my barber. I was actually I was a third year med student when his wife came in and had their baby. So I remember I was on my OB guy rotation, helping deliver his baby. I'm like, man, that's my barber, yo. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> but, then, but then, you know, we would go to the barber shop and we would, um, you know, we would do these things like, like, you know, these screening type of stuff, but we didn't do anything with it. Like you're saying, we, we, we had no real link. We hadn't thought it through to get that back to the, to the doctor. We just said, Hey, your blood pressure is this. You should go talk to somebody. That's all we could offer. Um, so my first question there will be, does that work, right? So if I take your blood pressure and just say, hey, you need to go talk to somebody, is that, you know, how many times out of 10 is that person actually going to do that? And the second question is, if that doesn't work, you know, what does work? Right. So, yeah, that, that's a, a, you know, a great question. I think that's where some of the initial studies of B. Wayne Kong as, as well as uh, Dr. Victor, you know, these individuals that in the, you know, 80s and then also in the uh, in the 70s really took a look at, um, you know, using uh, that relationship. How do you establish a relationship with a healthcare system or healthcare network? And when there's a healthcare network um, and providers that are kind of linked in with the barbershop and, can, and you can act uh, according to that data, that's when patients are best served. In addition to having these liaisons that can help them remind them to get their blood pressure, take, did you take, take your medicine, you know, are you compliant, all this other stuff, and having the barbers kind of serve hand in hand, if you will, with the healthcare community. And that's truly where it helps to just capture the information and not do anything with it, you know, it doesn't do as much justice for the community if, uh, un, unless you actually do something with that data. And so, uh, with my association, you know, so, so there's live share and live share is a startup company that, um, really looks before, at serve as that. Before you go here, let me just, let me just tell everybody, this is not like any sort of like commercial promo, nothing like that. He's not paying me to do this. None, none of that stuff. He just told me he had a fascinating concept for the, um, you know, a way we could address disparities in the black health community. And I think it may, you know, I think the concept makes sense. So I wanted to bring him on here, let him chat about it. But just so everybody knows, this is not like a, a big promo thing we're doing for live chair or anything of that sort, but he's just going to talk about his experience and what he's going through and, you know, what he's part of in this live chair. All right, my bad. Go ahead. Oh, no problem. Thank you. So, you know, with that, it was, you know, it, it got back to the whole story of me and my wife and, you know, I'd already, you know, thought about um, the entrepreneurial aspect of, you know, doing something that both my wife and I can kind of, you know, A, enjoy, but yet at the same time be like a, you know, just a, in a, in a you know, marriage of, you know, our, our careers you know, offering healthcare at the, you know, hair salon or the barbershop. And so, you know, I had put it on the back burner and then lo and behold, I saw something on uh, on a, uh, another friend of mine, another CT surgeon. You know, we always had these conversations in regards to entrepreneurship and he had presented, you know, this newspaper article uh, and it was of, you know, live year, you know, this, you know, barbers, you know, healthcare being delivered in barbershops. 
and I had seen the, this done before in LA and other places, but what was different was the, the platform that was used, the, the use of technology and how integrated that core piece of healthcare was. And I thought that that was something that really just made a whole lot of sense as far as, first of all, you have a uh, scheduling and booking sort of platform and app. So you're capturing data, you're getting information of your, your, you know, of your patient or, or the client. And then they're being able to get a, um, do a blood pressure at the barbershop. And what happens is that that information is recorded and that that information is, is felt that if we can give that to a, a provider or some sort of health network, that can help all those other things that we discussed. Decreasing- so, so the, the scheduling, you're scheduling for the, for your, for your, your cut, right? You're not scheduling Correct. for the, blood, you're scheduling for the, okay. No. And, and, we, and, and so, and what it is, is the blood pressure is essentially a part of the service that you receive. The the barbershop service. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. And so, you know, I uh, was able to see it in, in kind of full display as far as uh, out, out in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, Chanel, uh, Chanel Shakur, um, who has a great barbershop out there in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Check it out if you, if you guys are able to. And so um, with that, uh, he, uh, he's a, a barber that is really in tune with the need um, to, to help his community, uh, both through um, entrepreneurship, but more importantly for healthcare and having this notion of if we have a healthier community, we'll have a, a better community, a more sustainable community. And so with that, he gives, uh, you know, talks and, and kind of encourages people to get their blood pressure checked. And it's that sort of consistency, having that on the mind of knowing what my numbers are. Um, uh, to help decrease, um, you know, blood pressure, or help decrease rates of hypertension. And what ends up happening is it spawns discussion as far as, you know, what should I be doing to eat right? And when I went out to Baltimore, um, there was a, you know, 35 year old guy that, you know, had high blood pressure. I mean, his blood pressure was elevated. And this was kind of like the first time he had it, ever really had it checked. Kind of led to some discussions between he and I about, you know, what he should do, what his diet should be, what sort of exercises he could do, uh, him to kind of understand what his family history is, going back and kind of finding out what his family history is. And so it really raises the level of discussion and it allows men to have discussions about their health in a place in which they feel comfortable, in which everyone can kind of participate and learn. And when we as a community are doing something positively, now we can sit up here and positively affect, you know, other people around us by constantly being on our mind of let, let, let's all be healthy. You know, if this is just kind of the in vogue thing to do, this is just the thing that we're doing that we're taking um, our health as a priority, which COVID-19 has really hit home as a, it's Im- imperative for us to take our, our health as a priority. And if we do it as a community, we'll, we'll be better for it. All right. So. Now, you and I had this discussion. You were trying to tell me that we should let the barbershops be open during the COVID-19 lockdown. And I said, Dr. Steven Noble, you got to be out your mind. <laughs> but um, you're sticking by your gun. So I want to hear, I haven't, yeah. I haven't heard the argument yet. Let me hear the argument. Yeah. So uh, first and foremost, uh, the argument for, um, you know, barbershops to be open in COVID-19. I think that uh, one is that there people are going to get their hair cut regardless. I mean, no matter how you leverage it, it it's going to happen. This is just, you know, even the president is getting his haircut. You know, all all the people that you're seeing on TV are getting their haircuts. Your mayor is getting, their, you know, her haircut, you know. And so people are going to get their haircut. This is a service that's going to be rendered somehow, some way. You just can't prevent that. Uh, the second thing is that uh, we can use, if done a pr- the second thing is in regards to when is it appropriate for the masses to do it. And although I think that barbershops can be open during this COVID-19 season, I'm not necessarily saying it's appropriate for every shop to be open all over, you know, America, especially if we find out, you know, what the certain COVID rates are in certain particular sort of, uh, you know, communities and areas. So I do think that there has to be a, uh, uh, a interplay and, and cohesiveness between public health, uh, barbershops, you know, state boards, things of that nature. The third thing is that, um, te- you know, the hope was that testing was going to be a lot better than, than what it has been. And the thought was that maybe we could use barbershops as places to test. And if we could use barbershops as places to test, we could get a better sampling of the community. Mm-hmm. The thought behind that was that healthcare, traditional healthcare has always had some barriers for black and brown people, even black people in particular. And so if you sit up here and say, oh, we're only going to get tests in traditional healthcare facilities, 
we would miss a large percentage of, you know, of our people and of society at large. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting that a few days ago that um, the New York governor of Cuomo gave the report of their random 3,000 testing across the state, which was done in grocery stores, which, you know, already goes to show that there are places, you know, individuals considering doing mass testing in places that aren't your traditional places of healthcare. What I propose is that if you do it within barbershops um, and, and hair salons, you may capture a different group of people. You're capturing it here at the grocery store, but maybe in other situations, you'll, you'll capture a different group of people. And if you can put policies and procedures that help protect the, both the, the, the barber, the hairstylist, as well as the patient, that would be better. Especially, I would contend, that the barbershop and hair salon may be better places to, to capture uh, some of this data than your grocery store, especially because some of the training that goes into barbers and hairstylists through their, you know, state board of cosmetology and barbershops. Interesting. Okay. So your your primary thing isn't necessarily that, man, people got to get their haircuts. You're saying, hey, people are going to get your haircuts no matter what you do anyways, right? Um, and on top of that, we, we can provide a meaningful service that benefits the healthcare infrastructure um, you know, through the barbershops. Yeah. And, and, and I think taking a very, I don't want to say simplistic view, uh, view of it, but looking, you know, rearranging or, 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 or restructuring the way that we look at barbershops and, and hair salons more so as extensions of the healthcare community. How can we foster a relationship between barbershops and hair salons so that they are an extension of the healthcare community? How can we bring them into the fold? It's been done with churches before. It's been done in other institutions, but how can we establish a move a more formal and structured relationship. And let's be honest, I mean, part of the reason why those relationships haven't really kind of developed really comes down to, you know, money and, and how do you figure out, you know, uh, the payment, the, you know, fee for service, the payment factor, all those sort of things. And so that was really kind of the, the lynch, uh, the link, linchpin in between, uh, a lot of these studies that we saw in which the association works for black people. But how do you make it work within the healthcare system, which um, is really, you know, is, is a fee for services? You know, I think this is really fascinating because I, I mean, I don't know this to be true. I don't, or it might just be anecdotal, but I feel as though a lot of black men, at least at some point in time, have considered like cutting hair. You know, like all of us have, all of us have asked ourselves that question. All of us have tried to cut. Well, mo a lot of us have tried to cut our own hair. We try to cut our boys' hair. I tell you, my brother. My brother cut my hair, Dr. Daniel, he cut my hair from the time we were itty bitty all the way through, you know, till we moved apart from each other. And, you know, I'll tell you a story. When I was a kid, at the very start, when we started trying to cut each other's hair, like he cut mine up. I was like, okay, all right, I'm, I'm kind of clean, okay. And it was my turn to cut his hair. So I was cutting his hair, I was feeling good, I was feeling good. Um, and he was like, oh, Dale, that's pretty good. Go ahead and stop. But I didn't stop. I was like, nah, I can keep on making it better. And then I jacked it up, you know, I completely messed it up. And then he never let me cut his hair ever since then. So that ruined my barber dreams. But, you know, Honestly, I mean, I'll, I'll ask you the question and tell me about your friends, but I feel as though probably most black men I know have considered this idea of, hey, can I cut, can I cut hair? You know, like, should I be not, not saying that they want to be a barber for a profession, but, you know, the barber and the com black community does represent, I, I don't know what it is, but it represents something where all of us at some point in time question, can I cut hair? It gives you respect, right? So the, the kid in high school cutting all his boys' hairs, that kid got respect. Like, yo, that's T, yo, he cut everybody's hair, right? So, so that person has respect. Uh, so, you know, were you one of those kids you, you try to cut? I, you know, I, like you, I try to cut my own hair and it, it does not go well. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's amazing that as a surgeon, I, you know, I, I let the professionals, you know, do their job. And these individuals are professional. And, and the reason why they hold the status that they do is these, you know, these individuals create um, beauty. They create, you know, what we, you know, you know, um, they create meaningful. a better version of ourselves, you know what I'm saying? And so when you can sit up here and, you know, walk into a barbershop and, you know, you're kind of looking all disheveled and whatever, and then walk out with that fresh cut, you know, that, you know, person that has just molded you into, in, into something great. And these guys, you know, guys and gals mold you into a better version of yourself. And for that, you know, sense of pride, it's, it's very powerful. I mean, that's very influential to be able to within 20 to 30 minutes instill a pride and good feeling about that person, you know, that they may not have had 30 minutes ago, but when they see that look in the mirror and that is having a three-year-old that takes you back to being a three-year-old, that whole ego, you know, centric self of looking at yourself in the mirror and be like, I like, I love what I see. I love what I see. And that's, that's what, you know, what the shopping salons provide to you. And that feeling is, you know, 
links you to that individual. Mm-hmm. I mean, you look at your barber like, yeah, that's 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 my guy. And a, and a lot of people they have fond memories about their barber. I mean, my wife gets great gifts from her clients, and I mean, they still remember. They call her up. They you know are willing to like travel all over for her to do their hair because it is you know you don't you can't just trust your hair to just anybody. And there's horror stories of hair, you know, people losing their hair, you know, you know, getting their line messed up, trying to go to another yeah. barber. So when you find that person that you like, um, you know, it, it, it can be life changing. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they learn the shape of your head and everything. So they know how to, oh, man. How to move those blades. Um, all right. So we're going to have to wrap up here. But what I'm hearing is that the black barbershops and maybe not just the black barbershops, maybe all barbershops, but specifically in the black community, at least. Um, as a potential start because of the the importance of the barbershop in the black community, the black barbershop needs to be an extension of healthcare. And there needs to be, and it sounds like you guys are working on, I don't know who else is out there working on this concept, but, you know, somebody needs to figure out at least some sort of reimbursement platform, something to make it worthwhile for people to try to actually solve this problem. Because like you said, people have been thinking about this forever. My uncle's in New York and you know, he's got projects. He's been doing this. I I know a lot of people who do this thing, but who, how are we going to be able to turn it into a, a real infrastructure, you know, a real system that is sustainable across the country and cities, every major city across the country. So we can actually use that input data to, to impact population health. I like the idea. I'm a fan. Black barbershops extension of the healthcare. I'm a fan. I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you a last word here. Then I'm gonna wrap it up for this episode. And um, you know, this this episode again is non traditional, but it's making me think about us doing more episodes like this. Black men and white coast. Our purpose, our focus is really always to to encourage the next generation to become doctors. So this this episode is a little bit different, but I just want to just want to remind you guys that being a doctor doesn't mean that you're limited to just the operating room of just or just the clinic, just your patients. Being a doctor, see what Dr. Noble's doing here. He's 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 outside. He's a surgeon. He's outside the OR. He's thinking about other ways that he can help people and impact lives. So all that is part of being a doctor. Right. So you might not necessarily always impact a life by by giving a patient a medication or by cutting them open and and, you know, doing a transplant or whatever. There's different ways, different things you can do as a medical doctor to make people's lives better. All right, I'm gonna give you the last word and then I'm gonna wrap it up. So Dr. Daniel Hale Williams uh, was a cardiothoracic surgeon, um, the uh, first um, African-American surgeon to perform heart surgery and is credited as being the first uh, surgeon to, to perform a successful open heart surgery said that if people who don't make provision for their own sick and suffering are not worthy of civilization. And I think during this time of COVID-19, we're being asked, are we worthy of civilization? Are we worthy of being able to have this society, this civilization that we have? And so it really charges all of us to sit up here and look out for our sick and suffering. And I think that this gives us the opportunity to re, uh, reassess a system, a healthcare system, and ask ourselves, uh, is it as good as it could be? Did it work for everybody? And if it didn't work for everybody, especially for black people, which we're seeing, uh, what can we do differently? And, and can we have the healthcare revolution, uh, that we need and that, uh, that, that we desire? And I think that the black barbershop and the black hair salons are one of those, uh, institutions that could be at the forefront of this revolution that's coming by. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My God, Dr. Stephen Noble. Thank you for being here on this episode. First of a kind for black men and white coast. And I think you convinced me, my friend. I think you let me know the impacts, the importance of the black barbershop in healthcare. So thank you for taking the time. I know you're a busy guy, man. You've been everywhere lately. And I appreciate you taking a few minutes just to be here and talk to the black men and white coats audience. Also looking forward to your book. I'm going to go ahead and throw it out there. So I appreciate it. Yeah. You're working out. He, uh, he's working on a book right now, children's book, and it's going to be inspirational for the kids. So you guys get ready for that. Um, I'm excited. I get, I get to play a small role in helping you make that, make that book come to fruition. So, you know, um, I'm really looking forward to that book. Dr. Stephen Noble, thank you so very much. Everybody, all the listeners, thank you guys for checking this episode of Black Men and White Coats out. You know, support your barbers, support your stylists. You got to keep that going in the community here. Remember, if you're a pre-medical student, check out premedmondays.com, premedmondays.com, uh, diversemedicine.com for everybody else. We will see you online. Thank you. Love you guys. Do it like flagger, yeah. I'm kicking flavor, no 
saga, yo. Ay, I like them blues. I might go Jenny like Jackson. I got the margin, yo. It's all about progression. Life is like a blessing. Everything a win, loss is like a lesson. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, ain't no time for stressing. I've been really stacking. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, if you wanna go get it, stop playing around. Really got on racks, ain't playing around. If you wanna go get it, stop playing around. Really got on racks, ain't playing around. Black men, white yeah. coat, shit, we up right now, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you gotta set you a goal.